to the whole of you. The only thing is we are rushing with this course <laughs> to get it going. Okay, so uh, last week, should we start? Let me get my glasses out first. And then I can start properly. Do you want to start with your hands? Yes. <coughs> last week on ignorance, what ignorance is, and how without knowledge things don't work. It's really important to have knowledge in anything you do in life. Haven't you noticed if you don't have knowledge, something which may be wrong yesterday will be right today because of knowledge. Something that many of you have practiced yoga the last few years. Two years ago, without knowledge, maybe you would have lost your temper without even thinking twice. Mm. And then feel sick all night and feel sick the next day and keep the anger in for months and weeks. But with knowledge, what have you learned? You've learned to practice when the anger comes up, to watch it, observe it. Do not allow it to control you to try and restrain the anger and use that energy towards something else, right? So, would you all say, those who have been practicing for a few years, that you're much better now than a few years back? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You're better. Maybe not perfect, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So, but better. So, this is exactly the study of the science. With knowledge, you can really make your life a better place. So, get some knowledge. So, we covered ignorance last week. And um, here it says, what is real ignorance? Ignorance is regarding the impermanent as permanent, the impure as pure, the painful as pleasant, and the non-self as the self. So let's cover the first one. Regarding the impermanent as permanent, simple, our lives. It is impermanent, we all know, correct? Any of you not going to die? Physically, each and every one of us in this room is going to die, lose our physical body. Our physical body is going to drop off. And um, so, but many of us live and act and behave as if we're going to have it forever, as ignorance. This is the cause of your problems. Understand that really you are not this body. The body is on loan. Understand it well. Understand it well. It is not permanent. And when you can understand that it's not permanent, when sorrow comes to you, when hard times come to you, then you go, oh, but it's not permanent. It's not permanent. This world is like a play, as Shakespeare would say. Life is but a play. And we are but actors on the stage. It's going to pass. It's all going to pass. So when you understand the impermanence of life, you understand the impermanence of pain, which we all resist. 
and we think it's going to last forever. Anybody been, been in pain and you thought it's never going to end, it's never going to end, it's never going to end. But once you understand, oh, everything is going to end. And not only pain, also pleasure. Everything is going to end. As you know it here. As you know this stage, this field. All right, are you understanding that? Is it loud enough? Yes. Yes. And then the impure as pure. How many times in our life, you know, we will, you know, prior to the knowledge, I think many of us have done and said things that are not very nice in our lives, not very good, that have been hurtful, that have been painful, and we've justified it. It doesn't matter. You know, we're all here talking about someone detrimental to them you know, really being nasty, not discussing them as something positive, or how can you know this person has this fault, how can we help them? No, but detrimental. But something really nasty, and we all think, well, this is fine, we're fine doing it. Hmm? Our thoughts that we live in daily, we may think it's normal, all the negative thoughts that we have, but when you get knowledge, you realize Oh my God, so many of these thoughts I've had are really quite impure. And for years, I thought they were pure. You know, for example, like I've often said, when I first started to study about truthfulness, I thought for sure I was a truthful person. I was a good person. But when I really started to meditate and watch my mind think, I go, oh my God, this is a shock. Mm -hmm. For years I thought, I'm a good person, and I realized, what do I do that is good? What have I done for anybody that is good? It's all about I, me, and mine. How can I call it good? Everything that I'm thinking is about myself. Everything is, does it benefit me? Does it benefit me? I need, I want, I have to have. And I thought that was pure. And so when my husband will say what he wants, it's always what I want. It was more important. The ego totally took over totally took over. And it was such impure thinking, thinking that I am better than anybody else. So impure. Because most of us live in our personal ego. Most of us. Not because of anything, because it's just the way we were brought up. And I saw in my mind that it was so much I, me, and mine. No wonder I was miserable. And no wonder when anybody was trying to tell me their part of the story, it was like a brick wall. And I thought, they don't understand me. But it really was. I don't understand them as well. I don't understand them. I'm not even listening. I'm only listening to my own thoughts. So it's quite impure, and we regard it as pure. Then the painful as pleasant. Now oh, there's so many things that are painful to us, and we regard as pleasant. Heroin. So many people, drugs, how many people hurt their bodies and they think it's, immediately they think it's pleasant, it's pleasant. Alcohol abuse, smoking, all these things harm us, causes great pain in the end. But we regard them as pleasant. So many things people do to their bodies, they torture their bodies. Many processions, they whip themselves. Many schools of thoughts. Oh, I'm doing it for God. <laughs> Suicide bombers, I'm doing it for Allah. It's really regarding what is so painful as if <coughs> they really believe, these people really believe that they're doing the right thing. And that's all based on ignorance. And this is why Lord Jesus said at the end, what did he say on the cross? My Father in heaven, forgive them. They know not what they do. They were in ignorance. But ignorance or no ignorance, you have the comic results. As you so, the forgiveness is there. But the comic result has to come has to come. You throw a boomerang out, it has to come back. That's the idea. 
So here, many, many people regard painful things as pleasant. I remember when I first started doing counseling, you know, many people love parties. Many people love parties. And there's nothing wrong with that. But they go to these parties, and then the next day they come and see me, very disturbed. And I said, why are you disturbed? And this is what they taught me. They said, well, I went to a party last night, and I got home really very late at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. I had, you know, I was looking forward to having a good time. A woman, for example, will say, I wore my best dress, and nobody even mentioned anything. I came back home, felt horrible, nobody. And this whole conversation goes on. You know? And um, a man may tell me, oh, I was looking for the girl in my life, I take her home, it was a disappointment, and da 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 da, and all that stuff. And you know, and I go, oh my god, such a lot of heartache. <laughs> such a lot of heartache. So I ask them, why do you do it? If every time you go out, you come back, and you feel so miserable, why do you do it? They can't answer me. Oh, because, because I would have no friends with it, really. I said, you can have friends and have nice time with your friends and go out for a nice dinner, but if every time you go to these parties and everybody gets drunk and everything happens and you're so miserable, why do you do it? If you're happy, go. But I can't understand why you think you're going to be so happy each and every time you tell me the next day you suffer. Logic would say, if you are suffering, why repeat the action? It's like battered people, battered women, battered men. Many men take emotional assault. Why do you take it? Women take emotional assault. Why do you take it? Because I love. I'm in love. As if it's a good thing to allow somebody to batter you yeah. up. You're not doing yourself any good, and neither are you doing them any good. The more they hurt you, the more karma they create. Why don't you stop the cycle just by saying, I refuse to take this kind of treatment? I don't deserve it, and walk out. Why do you allow it to happen for years and years and years? And say, oh, but we love each other. And then about 20 years down the road, broken, battered, painful. I should have done it 20 years ago. You've lost 20 years of your life. But when you talk to them at the early stages, they will say, no, but I really love him. But I really love her. But I really love her. Oh, she'll change. Oh, she'll change. Oh, he'll change. But nobody changes unless you change. If you change, then you become the example. But if you don't change, nobody will change. Unless they suffer so much that they have to change. But you are not responsible for their change. How can you be? Can you? Can you change anyone? Have you tried? It's impossible. The only thing you can do is advise them. And then even they might bite your neck off for advising them. So what can you do? Can you just love them? That's it. You try to change them, the more they resist. So, you know, it's a very delicate thing. And so many of us, you know, have painful habits that we, got, we, we think are pleasant. So we keep doing it. It's almost like we've forgotten we have a brain that we can analyze things. It's just like we just go, we just go, we just go. It's like robots or zombies. And then we blame God when something goes wrong. Oh, why did God do this to me? I said, well, you think God's so big? So you're so important that God's going to spend the entire time thinking about you and just picking on you all the time? I said, you haven't understood God. God is love. Love is everywhere. God is energy, dynamic energy. You apply love, you receive love. You apply uh, pain, you receive pain. That's all it is. It mirrors you. That's the energy. It mirrors you. And the intensity... As Sri Patanjali says, <coughs> that samadhi can be achieved very quickly by the keen and intent practitioner. So if your practice is intent, then your joy will be intense. If your practice is weak, your joy will be weak. It's up to you. It's always up to you. That's our choice. That's the free will. At every single second, we can switch the button on or off, high or low, up to us. The rest then is determined by destiny, by our actions. We've done that. Too late. 
we have to face the consequences. So in yoga, we try to avoid this. So that's why we work so much on ourselves. We try to avoid creating more negative karma. We try to avoid causing pain. These things we are trying to avoid so that we build up our life, so that we create good energy around us. I call it the best insurance you can buy. And nobody can give it to you. It's in your own mind, it's in your own body, and it's in you. So this is, uh, and then finally, uh, ignorance is regarding the non-self as the self. The non-self. Now look at the self, is in capital S. In mm. yoga, we call that God or that dynamic force or the divine consciousness as the real self with a capital S. Now many times, we will identify with our own minds and say it's coming from a higher source. <laughs> Haven't you seen many people do it? They do something wrong. Oh, there's a lovely story, Sanskrit story. And let me explain to you regarding the non-self as the self. There was this uh, monk and he had this beautiful garden that he loved so much. And then he had a cow, that, uh, I mean his friend had a cow living next door. One day, you know, every day the monk tells everybody that passes, oh, have you seen my garden? Have you seen my garden? Isn't it beautiful? I put so much love into my garden. And everybody goes, wow, what a garden. And one day he goes out, and the neighbor's cow comes in and spoils the garden. When he comes home, he gets so angry, so angry, so angry, he starts beating the cow. So the neighbor comes and goes, why are you beating? Can't you see? He is, what is he doing, your cow? He spoiled all my beautiful garden. So you know what? God told me to beat him. So the neighbor goes, oh, how come God asks you to beat the cow and when the garden is beautiful, you are the one who makes it beautiful? Do you understand? Mm -hmm. How we use the divine to suit ourselves. To suit ourselves. Always we suit ourselves. The garden I did. So beautiful. The beating, God did. <laughs> if God is everywhere, then God made the garden beautiful, and God did the beating, right? So, uh, and this is how we live. We regard that which is not ourselves as ourselves. Again, going back to who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Where have you come from? What are you when the body dies? Are you prana? Are you ether? Are you energy? What are you? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? The constant question, who am I? Rama, Ramana Maharishi said, just by asking that question, which is a path of jnana yoga, just by asking the question constantly, constantly, doing nothing else, you will realize the truth. Who am I? Who am I? How can we forget that we, we're energy? How do we forget it all the time? I'm not this body. I'm not this mind. Immortal self I am. I never die. The energy that is really the self that is in me never dies. Never dies. How do I forget it every single day of my life and get so involved with this life as if every part of me will suffer if I don't get what I want? Why do I put myself in so much pain when I, when I know the impermanence of it all? When you understand the impermanence of all, then pain is just the same as pleasure. Passes. Everything passes. So watch your beautiful movie and create a beautiful show. Make it dynamic. Make your life dynamic. This is the practice of yoga. Use that energy that is the self, that abides in everyone. Deep in the hearts of all is the light of all lights, say the Bhagavad Gita. The Upanishads, the Lord of love, no larger than the thumb, lives in the hearts of all. Lives in the hearts of all. So there, that's the self. Awaken that self. Awaken that energy. But no, 
that you and it are separate in a way. Yes, it is in you, but are you in it? Have you forgotten? And this is and this is all the cause of everything that happens that brings it back to life. We get so wrapped up in the endless cycle of pain and pain and pain and suffering. Endless cycle, doesn't it? How many people come to me? How many people, when they go through terrible pain or suffering, oh, I'm just fed up with life now. I don't understand the purpose of it. No point in living. I might as well die. Not that easy, right? <laughs> not that easy. <clears throat> so what do you do? How do you get yourself out of that black hole? With knowledge. With knowledge. Oh, I'm in this black hole. I'm in this horrible place. To remind me who I am. To search. To get questions. Because when you're in a horrible place, you want to get out. You want to run out. So you want to find a way out. And the only way out, there is only one way out. You can try temp their temporary ways out, you know, drugs, alcohol, to drown yourself. They're temporary. Permanent way out is only to understand who you really are and drop the rest of the temporary measures. Because now, not only do you have your sorrow, you have an addiction to deal with. You have two things. How many people today, when they go into depression or panic attacks, they go to a doctor? And straight away, it's um, antidepressants. It's anybody's fault. It's nobody's fault. It's just the way the world is today. So many people have depression. So many people. The doctors don't know what to do anymore. The chemical firms, the pharmaceuticals give them these antidepressants. So what happens? They take these antidepressants. Six months later, eight months later, one year later, seven years later, they become like zombies. I don't know if you've seen them. I've seen so many in my life. They walk like this. Oh no, I'm always tired. There's, I've lost my drive. I don't want to do anything. What are you on? How many years have you been on it? Don't you know? Don't you understand? Suffering is normal. Buddha says, for double truth, there is suffering. But nowadays we want a quick fix. Everything quickly, quickly, quickly. We, can't. we have so much time to build up our physical muscles, to go to the gym, to look nice, to look beautiful, to look handsome. And so little time to build up our spiritual muscles. How do you build up your spiritual strength? By riding every obstacle that comes in your way. Oh, this has come to me for a reason, for learning. Turn around. Why should I become a victim? Let me see my strength. And yes, of course I'm going to cry. Of course it's painful. Who doesn't suffer pain? Do you know anybody who doesn't suffer pain? Keep asking yourself that. Why do you think you're so special? Why do you think you're so wonderful? Why do you think you're the only one the person in the world that shouldn't suffer pain? What gives you that? And every time you get that big, huge ego that means poor me, go imagine you're up in one of those planets, one of those stars, and look down on yourself. You're not even the size of a grain of sand. So much importance. I, me, my, poor me. You know, after a while, when you see it, you have to laugh at yourself. You know, I used to be like this. And I remember when I saw, every time I got into this mindset, poor me mode, I'd stop right there and stop. And I'd remember my master's story about how, let's say you want to climb a tall building. When you're on the ground floor, you can see everybody's eyes, nose, mouth, and you see people as they are. And then you go to the first floor, you can still see them quite clearly. You go to the 10th floor, you can't make out the features, but you see people walking. You go to the 50th floor, you can't see any more features, you may see certain colors, but they start to be together. You go to the hundredth floor, everybody looks like ants. So now you have a different view. Everybody looks the same. Everybody looks the same, but when you're down there, everybody looks different. So you start to get a bird's eye view of life. And another story he tells is like, 
you know, we think we're all separated, we're all so important, so we forget to live life as brothers and sisters and care for each other and love each other, right? And the other story he tells is like when children go into the bakery or to a chocolate factory, you know, they'll say, oh, I want this chocolate that looks like a teddy bear. Oh, I want this chocolate that looks like the square. I want this chocolate that looks like a gollywog. But in the end, all those different shaped chocolates is actually made from one same recipe. It just looks different. Just looks different. And people fight over, my shape is better than your shape, and this one is better than that one. But really, hey people, we're all the same. We all come from that same oneness. We all come from the same oneness. The sooner we see it, the less involved we get into a... a and then it's not my depression. Okay, I am upset because this has happened to me. I am okay. My mind is upset. But if you look at me, I've still got my two arms, two legs. <laughs> you know, my father was such an incredible man when he had his uh, when when he had cancer, and uh, the doctor said he would have not long to live. He lived another eight years because I think he was just so positive, so positive. And it was so funny when his legs used to hurt or his back used to hurt. He said, "Poor leg." Poor leg. What did I? What did I do to you that you should suffer this pain? I need love. What did I do to you that you should? I, you could see he was totally disconnected, totally disconnected from the pain, because he saw his leg as having the pain and not him. And every morning, every morning, my dad. I mean, since I was a child, I've seen him get up in the morning. The first thing he do is. It wasn't his. And I remember once uh, I was I came home from school. I must have been thirteen or fourteen. And my father had um, a lot of shops. He used to make uniforms for uh, the navy during after the war and during the wartime. That's how they made their money. And they had lots of shops in Vietnam. And uh, what happened is overnight all the shops were bombed. So all their stock, all the money was lost. I remember coming home from school and telling my mother, Oh Chandra, we've lost everything. But don't worry, we came with nothing. Easy to make it again. And he did. Mindset. Easy to make it again. Don't worry. We came with nothing. So we're back to square one. When I married you, I had so little. So now you have much more than what we had. <laughs> Let's start again. And immediately they're thinking of ideas in his brothers, because the six brothers work <coughs> unity together, each working with each other. And they got an idea and they went into hotel business. And the wives whom they had bought the jewelry from my mom and my aunt said, okay, we'll give you all our jewelry, all that you've given us. Because, you know, in Indian families, when you're wealthy, immediately the first thing you do is buy your wife diamonds. That's the proper way. They don't do that in India, but the really educated Indians will do that. Because they realize that the wife is Lakshmi. Lakshmi means the goddess. Shakti and Shiva, we talk. And immediately, it's lucky if you serve your partner, the woman, she will bring joy in your home. This is the, what they, the belief system is, right? So it's nice, isn't it? Yeah. It's very beautiful. <laughs> All my jewelry, and I have plenty, it's in the bank, but I promised my mother I wouldn't sell it. <laughs> so I give it to my children. But everything I have is from my parents because they have this belief system that, you know, they'll give it once mom has so many, so let's give it to all my daughters now. The educated, you know, uh, families. Unfortunately, that's the real idea of the dowry system so that the child, the girl, will be. All right, if her husband passes away, she will always have something to sell or to, to look after herself. But nowadays it's all twisted, and the in law families take away all the dowry. It wasn't meant for them, it was for the daughters so that you know they could look after themselves. So, anyway, my mother and my aunt offered all their jewelry, they didn't need it, but it's all this kind of no fear, no worry, you know. Uh, why we came from nothing. So at least we have something now. 
We're so much better off than before. And this no fear really gets people going. And I had a friend um, many years later when I was running a retail business, and I had a friend who lost millions. And I saw him a few months later and I said, how do you feel? He said, nothing, no problem. I've lost it. It was meant to go. I'll make it again. And sure enough, because he had that mentality, he made it very soon, one year later. You know, it's really interesting to watch the mindset of a person, the total faith. So that saying goes, my master says, if you have complete faith, nothing is impossible. <coughs> See, in these people's minds, like my father, this man, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. The universe is abundant. Thomas Edison. He did like so many thousand of experiments to discover electricity, the electric bulb. After doing all these experiments, his house suddenly burns down one day. And his wife goes to him and his children say, oh, I'm so sorry, all your hard work. And he goes, no, you can start again. <laughs> and then he discovered the light bulb. So you see, when you have that kind of attitude that is fearless, it's almost like the universe will give it all to you because you, you're not projecting fear. The moment you would, what if, oh, it has to be this way. And I'll tell you one secret. You know, many times in my life I've seen people who do good deeds for other people. Maybe the good deeds they do for those people will never come back from those people. But the goodness always comes from a totally different direction that you just don't even expect. Totally different direction. I've seen it in so many yogis' lives recently. I used to see it in mine. So, you know, when we were building the yoga center. Suddenly, one of my friend, my husband's friend, who knows nothing about the work I do, he hears that I'm building this center. Without asking, he goes to my husband, I think I'd like to support your wife, he's 500 pounds. Why would he help me? Do you know? Doesn't even know me from Adam. So, it's really very interesting how this energy works. Ah, also, we are setting up the SIS charity here in Spain. My husband's and my lawyer in Spain introduced us to this lawyer. So we told him about the SIS charity. First time I met him. And I said, now, please let us know your views. He's apparently he's one of the top ten in, in, in Spain. Nothing. He doesn't want to charge us. I said, but you don't even know me. He said, don't worry, I'll check you out. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'll check the website, I'll check you out, I'll look at everything. And I said, please, check me out. 100% call back, absolutely no charge. Not only that, I went to Malaga yesterday to sign some papers to organize things, and he said, uh, you know, do you want the charity just Malaga or Cadiz, or do you want national? I said national, because we have people working with us from Madrid and Barcelona. Mm -hmm. So the, his junior lawyer says, oh, I'll go to Madrid then and put your you know, put, put, put this, this chari charitable bid in for you. And I go, oh, how much would it cost for your flight? She goes, no, my boss said, nothing. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, once you've set up your bank account in Spain, he wants to donate to SIS. Oh. So not only is he not charging us, mm. he wants to give us a donation. How does that work? You know, this is a total stranger. Mm -hmm. I mean, me and the lawyer, Amber, who was with me, we just both just tears in my eyes. Why would a total stranger want to help us so much? And then he, he answered us and he said, well, you know, we're so, lawyers are so busy now, uh, making people money, making, it's really nice for a change to do and give some money away. Mm -hmm. It makes us feel good about ourselves. So, mm -hmm. all this is like, you know, when you shift consciousness, just, all you have to do is just shift. Mm -hmm. And this is what knowledge gives you. Shift in consciousness, that fearlessness. I can do this. There is nothing to fear. Anyway, why worry? Take the risk. What have you got to lose? Your body is going to die anyway. What have you got to lose? What have you brought?
that you are going to take? What will you, you know, what did you bring from this world? You came naked as a baby and you are going to go without that body even. So what are you going to take with you? Not even one hair on your head. So why so much fear? What's the worst that can happen? You starve with it? I'm sure your people are intelligent today. They can go to the forest and look for a fruit apple. I'm sure you can go to, nowadays we're not so desperate. There's social service. <laughs> you get looked after. You never starve. Nobody ever starves. So what's the worst that could happen? How many people have said, oh, I'm going to lose my home, I'm going to lose my home, I'm going to lose my home. Our dear friend Ole and Kamala suffered so much hmm? when they you worked so hard and suddenly the credit crunch happened when at the time the property started to slide down. So much they worried for their home. And look at them today. How life worked out for them, the good you do comes back to you. It's not perfect, but my goodness, from losing everything. I remember there was a week where they had no food. You know that? And let me tell you a story, and I'm sure you will mind. That week when they were going through a difficult time, just before they were going to lose their house, they allowed us to do satsang in their home. This is going back two and a half years. Do you remember, Audrey, who did satsang in their pool area, right? Yeah, uh, because I think Kizzy was studying with her makeup school, yeah. right, or something. So we did it in her, their pool area. In comes a neighbor to them that morning without any food at all, without anything crying. So they announced to us, oh, no, our neighbor came in, really he's in such a bad state, he doesn't even have a plate of food. Do you mind if all the donations tonight, would you mind, goes to him? Do you know, for me, I was so, so, so touched because they could have done with it just as much. And I thought of other person in their time of need. I thought that was big of them, don't you? Mm -hmm. I was so like, it's easy when you have a lot to give away, but when you have virtually nothing yourself and you could get the opportunity to for you, and all they had to say is we need it, and I would say everybody collect for them, which we did a couple of times, right? But isn't it nice to know how much you allowed? Mm. You know, it's not good or bad. It just, see, problems come to people. But when you're good people, you always get looked after. This is my point I'm trying to, to make. Even at the worst situations, there's so much help. There's so much help. And obviously that to me was like brought a lump to my throat. And that night we actually raised 150 euros, do you remember? And they came back to me the next day, oh, you made him the happiest. He was like overjoyed and that was his fuel to get going again. Yes, Isn't that what you're yes. Total turning point. He totally yeah. turned his life around. To cheap to turn a person's life around for 150 euros, don't you think? Mm -hmm. His whole idea of negativity and nobody helps and all that turn around just by one good deed. You see how cheap it is to make people's life good? So easy. So easy. And yet we think so much. Da -da. Should I give two euros? Should I give one euro? I don't have. Da -da. <laughs> so much thinking. So much thinking. You know? And, and, and so easy to change people around. So easy. So this is all based on ignorance. I think I've talked a lot about ignorance. Mm. So I'd like all of us to read this again so you really remember it and never forget it. If you have your books, please turn to page 86. Ignorance is regarding the impermanent as Amen. the impure as Amen. The painful as, and the non-self as the self. It's quite easy to remember, right? So whenever you're kind of going into your, one of your mind games, say, hey, 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 I'm in ignorance. <laughs> Wake up, girl. That's what I tell myself. Stop the nonsense. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next one. Sutra 6. Can somebody read that to me? Somebody with a loud voice. Thank you, Poppy. Can I read Yeah? She wants to read? Of course, Where? let her read. Which one? 6. So it's 89. Oh, okay. Here. Okay. 6. This one? Yes. yes. That one as well. There. Okay. Egoism. Okay. Egoism is the intensification, as it were, of the power of the seer 
Purusha with that of the instrument of saying body-mind. Thank you. Egoism is the identification, forget as it were, confuses you, of the power of the seer with that of the instrument body-mind. And let me read, it, it all sounds so confusing, but it isn't. Here it says, the ego is the reflection of the true self on the mind. That didn't make it sound easier. But let me read to you something that even make it easier for you from the Upanishads. Now I want you to think of your ego, which is your personality, the person you are on this earth. The individual ego, the individual person. And the self, with a capital S, as that dynamic energy in you that never dies, that is permanent, that will go from one body to the other, or one planet to the other, who knows? I have no idea. <laughs> tell me when you die. Okay? <laughs> we'll come and tell you. <laughs> I only know what is now. <laughs> so here in the Upanishads, in the Mundaka Upanishad, it says, like two golden birds perched on the self-same tree. Can you see that mm -hmm. image? There's a tree, and there's two golden, they're both golden, huh? mm -hmm. birds. Intimate friends, the ego and the self. Intimate, they know each other intimately. They dwell in the same body. Okay, so you've got your ego personality, and you've got the higher self. The former eats the sweet and sour of fruits of the tree of life. The former eats the sweet and sour fruits of the tree of life, while the latter looks on in detachment. So the ego that is you, the personality, will enjoy the sweet and sour things of life. It will enjoy all of it. And the real you, the self, just watches it all. They call the witness of the mind, the one that watches the mind think. This watches the detachment. And how do you know that exists in you? Very simple exercise. Very simple to identify. Nothing fancy, very scientific. You think, oh, I want to do this. I don't want to do this. Who is the one that's watching the I want and the I don't want? The ego. The ego. Yes. There's something that's watching the I want, the ego saying I want. Yeah. The ego saying I don't want. I don't want yeah. But who's watching? The self. Self. Yeah. And <coughs> the self just watches. The intellect makes a decision, yeah. right? Which is you, based on your knowledge based on your knowledge. So if your knowledge is higher, your decision will be clearer and more beneficial to all. If your knowledge is based on the ego, just I, me, and mine, as I spoke before, your knowledge is more limited, your action will be more limited and less, uh, less beneficial. Are you understanding mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. Are you seeing it? Now see, there's kind of, like Lord Jesus said, be in, I am of this world, no, I am. Anybody remember? Be in this world, but not of this world. So you be in this world, that's the grounding, but no, you are not of this world. Don't belong here. It's only having, we just come here to have some fun. For me, it's have some fun, have some tears, have some laughter, meet some great people, enjoy some stuff, cry some stuff. And try and put as many good things into this world to make people laugh because the other doesn't seem to work too well. Common sense, nothing else. Goodness makes more people happy. Being nasty makes more people sad. I don't like negative energy. Positive energy makes me feel good. Simple. Keep it simple. And then do as much fun, have as much love in your life. Then your job is done and goodbye. Who's enjoyed the job? You have. Who's enjoyed life? You have. Don't think by doing 
uh, good deeds or anybody else that you're doing it for them. You've enjoyed the benefit of it. It's you that benefit in the end. It's just like when you're angry, you think your anger is going to destroy somebody else? It will if you act on it, but it's more likely to destroy you before it destroys anybody else. Why? Because when you go to bed at night, they'll eat you up, eat your mm -hmm. stomach up, eat your heart up. That person that you're angry with probably screamed, yelled at you, gone home, pretty satisfied. <laughs> you maintain that. You're in your own fire. You burn. You burn with your anger. So these are things that you start to realize when you see the ego and the self, right? They dwell in the same body. The former eats the sweet and sour fruits of the tree of life, while the latter looks on in detachment. As long as we think we are the ego, we feel attached and fall into sorrow. But realize that you are the self, the Lord of life. Realize that you are the self, the Lord of life. And you will be freed from sorrow. When you realize that you are the self, supreme source of life, supreme source of love, you tr transcend the duality of life and enter into a unitive state. In other words, when you realize who you really are, it doesn't matter what happens, you're happy. Unitive state is peace, neutrality. No fighting, no battles with your own mind. As Paramahansa and Yogananda said, who's your worst enemy? your mind, yourself. And the most incredible victory you can make in this life is the victory over your own mind. That's the hardest battle you will have to fight in your own life. So, are you understanding the ego and mm -hmm. the self? So he says here that, you know, when you don't understand that you have a higher self, when you're immersed in the ego, and this is the cause of coming back to life again and again and again. Because you think you are the mind. You don't realize that you have the potential to change that mind, to live in the highest and your highest self. So, number seven. Can somebody read it, please? Attachment is that which follows identification with pleasurable experiences. Everybody knows this one. <laughs> when you have a pleasurable experience, what happens? You want it again, and again, and again, and again. And if you don't have it, what happens? You get upset. You get really upset. You get really torn apart. And this is where most relationships are destroyed. Because while you start off in a brand new relationship, there is very there's a lot of love and attraction. And at that point, mostly, you just want so much to do things for the other person that there's a lightness, there's a joy. But after a time, what happens? You want to take over the person's mind. You start to say, this person belongs to me. <laughs> so you get attached to that person. My partner. How dare you speak to my partner? Jealousy arises. Fear arises. Because now what was so beautiful is turning painful. I, can I just say something then yes. about that? <laughs> it yes, just made can. me laugh. I, 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 I actually um, said to... Uh, my mother, we all know my mother. Yes. I said, you know, ma married men are not your property. She said, what do you mean? Whose property are they then? <laughs> I said, well, the wife's. No, no, she said, I don't believe in that. Nobody belongs to anybody. Which is true, isn't it? But then how do you... Which is absolutely... Do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> it's respect and honour. This is why yeah. exactly, the yeah. yamas and yamas. Yeah. Yes, nothing belongs to us. No. But in this but. world, if we didn't have certain boundaries, there would be chaos, there would be a lot yeah. of pain. This is why we study the non-violence, mm. the truthfulness. Now, uh, taking the property of somebody else is stealing. You're breaking mm. a law. Okay, maybe it doesn't belong to anybody, 
But in that family unit, they have become a family unit. Yeah. So when you go into that family unit and you take something out, what are you causing? Violence to that yeah. family, pain to that family, mm -hmm. disruption to that family. So you're breaking many lives. Yes, nobody owns anyone. Mm. But pure love will never take advantage of somebody else's sorrow. Mm. You cannot, if you really understand that we are all one, you cannot gain happiness from someone else's loss. No. No. You cannot. It will, you cannot. It mm. makes you suffer. Somebody else's loss takes you away. <clears throat> You can only do that when you're very selfish and you don't have any clue about what you're doing. And it creates lots of karma. To look at the vicious wheel that it creates. And do you think it can be denial or not? No, not really. They know what they're doing. I think people use a lot of excuses like yeah. you said before, you know? Yeah. When it suits them, oh, I'm not attached. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And other times, they will not say that, you know? I think people use a lot of these arguments to suit themselves. Mm. And this is why I keep repeating to you over and over again, the strongest grounding and the things that will help you make the right decisions in life is following the yamas and yamas, non-violence, truthfulness, non-stealing, you know, moderation in all your acts, the medium path, so that you don't get so lustful that you destroy other people's life. You see, this is no moderation. And then you want, you want, because the more you have pleasurable experiences, the more you want it. So, okay, and there's a sense of power, a false sense of power with people who do that. And many people do that. Many men will do that, many women mm. do that. There's a false sense of power. Hmm? I've seen it, and it's a manipulation of people's minds using lust as the, as the tool. And what happens is... Destruction of everybody in the end. I have not seen anything work like that. Mm. Works for some time, but then there's no ultimate respect in the end. Hmm? Whereas honor is really important. And you know what you did, Audrey, was so honorable. You know, when um, one of her friends, husband and her, one of her friends separated, a few months later, that gentleman came and asked her out. You know what the first thing she did was call her friend. Just ask me out. I'd like to go, but only if it doesn't hurt you. To go ahead, because of the nice way of doing it. Mm. Anyway, they all have to start their own new lives, right? Mm. Anyway, who was such honor, such dignity? Mm. That's respect. So a friend can never turn back to her and say, "No, oh, you took my husband from me," because it never happened. See, there is no now. Because it's so truthful, so honest, so beautiful, there's a respect that one gains for her, her way of handling things. It creates a respect. So this is, uh, the, see, there's, this is where people get very confused about non-attachment, attachment, mm. right? This is why I say be very clear, be very grounded. And Sri Patanjali tells us, by the practice of the eight limbs of yoga, what happens? The impurities will dwindle away by themselves. You just have to practice these good things and impurities will go from your mind. And there dawns the light of wisdom. Then, see, when all this nonsense goes, what do you see? Who are you? You see your own light. You see your own light. You see the self. You realize you're light. And then you make the right decisions. Even though it's hard, even though it's hard to let go of something that you think is going to be bad, <coughs> it's like a drug addict when they first, or an al alcoholic when they first start. It's so hard. It's so hard. It's really painful. I remember when my husband stopped smoking overnight. He said he felt like there was a monster inside him, <laughs> saying smoke, smoke, and it was a monster that was swirling in his. Stomach, and guess where he had cancer in his stomach? That's where it started. That monster that he was talking to me about. He said, it's just like always there. And he says, I'm constantly battling with my monster. Mm -hmm. Constant Same battle. Yeah, three years, and then after that, he won the battle. And he was anti-smoking. And then eight years later, he lost his life. But he did it. 
He did it. At least he did it. He did it. Willpower. You have to use your willpower for the highest good. And uh, so attachment is when you adopt, identify with something pleasurable. You want it again and again and again and again and again. And until you don't have it, you be, you're not happy. And that's attachment. That object or that subject makes you so happy. And then at the same time, so very unhappy. <laughs> So you have to decide which is it one. also materialistic things like people get attached to a car of and course. then they get attached oh, yeah, to the new yeah. computer, oh, Apple, and, and then they get attached to everything. And, and it Mobile goes on like that, doesn't yeah. it? Trying yes, to feed that hole. Handbag. Handbag. Yeah. Yeah. Anything. Shoes. Anything. 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 Yeah. It can be anything. Let me tell you a story, shall I? <laughs> <laughs> to explain this <laughs> attachment. <laughs> there was like, what are like, you doing? Yeah. Thank you. And we've got a wonderful presentation. And then after that, about time. So it'd be very interesting. You can explain it uh, to everybody in 15 minutes. Yeah. So let me tell you a story. It's a very famous Sanskrit story. There was this king called Janak, and he was, uh, you know, he was very respectable. Everybody loved him. Obviously, came very wealthy, and he went to his guru, his master, for spiritual education. Now. Because he was so in love with the spiritual education, he was always studying amongst the monks. The monks. And you know, one day the monks were all gossiping amidst themselves, saying, you know, our guru, our teacher, always looks at the king. It looks like he's his favorite student. And of course, he's a king. Of course he's going to treat us better than us. Now, the master heard all this. So he thought he'd give them a lesson. So one day they were all sitting down and meditating deeply. And the master shouted, Fire! Fire! All the monks jumped up, ran out. And King Janak just sat there <coughs> meditating deep into meditation. A few minutes later, all the monks came back and said, It's a false alarm. And the guru laughed. He said, you know, you are saying that he's my favorite. But look, I shouted fire. You ran out. And all you have is one piece of clothing extra on the clothesline. And you were attached with it. <laughs> but King Janak had a palace and all those million things in the palace. And he was not attached to it. Now they realized who was higher in knowledge. So that is attachment. Another story about attachment is uh, a master, and he was with a few monks, and there was a lady trying to get across the lake. Well, this has happened to many, many masters, actually. Many masters have told this similar story. And the lady crossing a lake, she couldn't, she couldn't, she was falling. So he actually picked her up, and pretty young girl took her across the lake, put her down. Now his brother monk, who was with him, said, Oh my God, oh my God, you're a monk, how could you do that? How could you carry this beautiful woman? And don't you know what it feels like to carry a beautiful woman? My master looks at him and says, I carried and brought her across the lake and left her there. You, my brother, are still carrying her in your mind. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> so you see how subtle attachment is? How judgments are made on attachment? How we judge people on what goes on in our own mind? Mm. So watch that. There's a physical, there's a mental attachment, and there's also a verbal attachment. Mm. So that is attachment. Next one, aversion. Aversion is that which follows identical identification with painful experiences. So, you know, sometimes this is even more difficult. 
aversion. Mm. I don't want. Oh, I have to let go of my attachment. Maybe you can work on it. But attachment in a negative way is also a dislike. I don't want. Mm. Oh, I can't be in the room because I don't like that person. Oh, I don't want to be next. And you have to. Let's say it's a family member. You have to. It's Christmas Eve. No, no, no. I can't. I can't. I can't stand my brother. So the whole family is disturbed because of I don't want to be. And create also coming back to bodily life again and again and again. Just as pleasurable experiences make you attached, painful experiences also make you attached. So you never come to closure. And this is what I keep telling people. You know, even when they leave their husbands and wives, and I've seen this happen so many times, 22 years later, they're remarried, already have more children, still angry at the first husband, or still angry at the first wife. Oh my God, this aversion that you have for the husband or the wife that left you so many years ago is destroying your life with this partner and all your children's life because of your negative attitude. This aversion is making you do horrible things in your life. And then it comes, all men are like this, or all women are like this. There's that thinking that sticks in the mind through the aversion. Through one bad experience, we get attached to it, we get, and then we think everything in life is going to be like that. And it isn't. It's an attachment. So aversion, watch out for it, will bring you back to bodily life. I always say, if you're angry with somebody, it's that song. Uh, it's, like, it's too late when you die. You know, none of you know it? To admit you don't see eye to eye. Yeah. It's, it's a son singing to the father. It's too late when you die to admit you don't see eye to eye. It doesn't matter if you don't see eye to eye. Admit it when you're alive. It's too late when you die. I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. No problem. But I have this opinion, you have this opinion, argue, argue, argue. You're never going to convince each other. You know what? I love you anyway. You have your opinion. You have your opinion? I have mine. I can accept it. What's the point? Why do I have to be right? It becomes extremely painful. Because I don't like your opinion. Okay, I don't like your opinion. Fine. I don't have to live your opinion, do I? I only have to live mine. So why am I holding this in my head? It destroys my life. Again and again and again, all these concepts don't bring you any joy. So I'm bringing back to bodily life to repeat and repeat and repeat till you learn the lesson. We are in a university. The universe is exactly that. That's why it's called the universe. We're studying here. We're studying about our real self. This is our playground to learn, our field to learn. We are scientists, yogis are scientists, learning about the mind, learning about the body, learning about the energy that lives in us, learning about this dynamic life force. That is the most important work that we should be doing. How exciting! Why do we waste our time on all this nonsense when this work is so exciting to realize the wealth of knowledge that lives inside of you. Everything you want to learn or know is within you. Is within you. Just have to go within. You'll find all the answers. So that's a version. And finally for today, clinging to life, flowing by its own potency, due to past experiences, exist even in the wild. Clinging to bodily life. What did we say in ignorance regarding the impermanent as permanent? Even people who are wise, and I've seen this too, people who you know, know about the soul, talk about the soul, always pray, etc., etc., when it comes to their own mortality, 
I don't want to die. I don't want to die. They're so frightened of death at the last minute. And it's all Sri Patanjali is telling us that, you know, this is, losing your body is such a big thing. You think if you're attached to one book or one show or one handbag, one car, how will you feel when you know you're going to lose your body? Mm. How are you going to feel at that moment? Easy to say, oh, I'm not scared of my own death. Easy to say that. How do you feel when you come close to it? It's really mm. Really frightening. And you see wise people can even clean, hold on. <coughs> exist even in your eyes. So be careful because if you cling on to your body, that brings you back again. The attachment to your body will not be free to fly to other planets. You cling to your body the last moment you think. Whatever you think, you will be reborn as. So if you have the desire, my body, I want a body, I want to you can come back in another body. Why? The universe is here to give us whatever we find. We create a future. That is the dynamism. That's the gift of the gods. That is the gift of the gods. So whatever you desire, the moment of death is what you will get in the next month. And this is why it's so important to practice well now, not at the last moment. Because at the last moment, you will not be able to control your mind. Because you're so used to thinking, I want, I want, I want, I have to have. You cannot, last moment, you cannot change. But if you practice all your life, last moment, like uh, Gandhi did when he got shot, what did he say? His mantra. Ram, Ram, Shri Ram, Jai Ram, Shri Ram, Shri Ram. Last moment. Why? Because he was repeating his mantra all the time. So when the last moment came, it wasn't, oh my God, I'm getting shot, I'm dying, somebody's killing me. Oh, Shri Ram. Lord Jesus, my Father, and I'm forgiving you know not what they do. My master a few months before he died, no, 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 this body is old. Getting old. If I can't serve, I don't need this instrument anymore. I can do much more without a body. Tell me. It's no use. If I can't serve, I don't need to be in this world. I don't need it anymore. What happens three months later? Perfectly healthy, he drops the body. Literally drops the body. Yeah, she told me that in May and dropped the body in August. And he was fine. No problems with health. He could even carry me at 88. He was that strong. He said, pick me up like this, you know? And, um, <laughs> Honest. <coughs> Three months later, he said, you know, he actually he was telling me, I'm going. What is, can I do much? It's getting old. If I can't serve, I don't need it. I'm only here to serve. I'm only here to give. There's no other reason. It's so amazing to watch it. So amazing to watch it. It really is so amazing to watch it. And the way he died, so clever. He even ordered all his ashes and, you know, because when a, a saint dies, you have to embalm the body a certain way, etc. He had called um, somebody up in India, saying he ordered all the, uh, the herbs and everything. And they said, shall we send it to you? And he goes, no, leave it in India. When I come to India, I'll let you know what to do with it. He was invited in India to this big opening, this film star was his, was his um, disciple, and he had his film, and it was a big opening of this, the premiere of the film, thousands of people, and there were cameramen, and the camera, one of the cameramen wanted to get so close to our master, actually hit him, yeah, knocked him, and so, but he didn't want to insult his, his host, because he was uh, one of the guests of honor, so, <coughs> sat through half the thing, got up an intermission with some of the disciples that were looking after him and said, take me home first to the hotel and then take me to the hospital. Because in India, if you, something like that so auspicious, like an opening, if a great master gets, goes there to the hospital, is not a good omen. 
So he had the unselfishness to get back to the hotel first and then go to the hospital. So it's not a bad omen for them. You know, and this is after, you know, and he had an aneurysm. And then he was fine. I actually spoke to him the next day and he called me and he said he was supposed to come to Gibraltar. And he said, Melanie, I am so, so, so sorry. I cannot come. I'm so sorry. Prepared so much. Please don't worry about anything. Please just get well. I already knew he wasn't going to work. And the interesting thing, we had over 600 people coming to see him. I had two hotels totally booked. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. August, the date was 22nd. When I called them, I thought, oh my God, we're going to have a hefty sum to pay. Because all the people that won't come, mm -hmm. just won't come. Many people will not pay. Some people are honorable. They will, but many won't. I've already seen this in the past. Oh my God, I said, I'll have to pay for it. I don't have the money. Oh, yoga center, we'll all raise it. Then, <coughs> but never mind, I called the hotel and told them the story. Do you know? I got told off by one of the hotels big time. And call me back and said, really sorry, we're not charging you. After telling me off. <laughs> and the other hotel, oh, totally understood. I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't. It was really a miracle. So you see, when you work around these great souls, and you know, I constantly see miracles happen. So of course, he died in India to make his home country people happy. Mm. His body was transported with the staff to America where he was buried there to make his disciples in America happy. So he pleased everybody in the end. Because <laughs> his burial was already arranged. Where, where was he buried? In the yoga In, in, in the Lotus. Lotus. Yeah, yeah. Where we're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah, November. Okay, I thought yeah. so, yeah. In the Lotus. There's a place called Chidambaram where you see a wax statue of him. It's right underneath. Yeah. yeah. So he's buried right underneath. Um, Jack keeps talking about him and um, um, uh, how he uh, had those lions that he was... Do, do you remember that, Melanie, or not? Which lions? Um, that used to sit out... Uh, yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. Jack yes. Is just loves that. He tells everybody. Yes, yes he sits with the lions, all yeah. the animals. Yeah. They come yeah. like babies in front of yeah. him. It's amazing. quite amazing to see. And uh, what they did in New York was quite amazing. They had a mass for all animals. And uh, uh, for the mass, they brought in, this was, um, each each master brought in an animal. And I think Gurudev brought in a snake. I have the DV video. I have a video of it somewhere. If anybody wants to borrow, if you so know So are to, all masters, Melanie, the same with animals? They all have that? The very highest of yeah. masters. Yeah. Yes. The very highest. Amazing. The highest, the highest vibration. Yeah, they have the same with animals. The animals don't uh, ever, ever hurt them. Like Saint Anthony. Saint Anthony, Saint Francis. Mm. Saint Francis Saint was another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. You see, they have this natural because they're vibrating at a different level from most people. They are, are vibrating in the force field of love. Okay, so. so animals can feel the love. They can feel the love. They feel no judgment. Mm. It's kind of like if you go to a, a presence of somebody who loves you, there's no judgment. It's pure love. A mother's love should be so pure. Parents' love should be so pure. You know? <laughs> Sometimes it isn't. It should be. <laughs> I know when I was sick, uh, I was often sick with asthma as a child, and I'd see my mother's face, and I was 50% better. 50% mm. better. Just seeing her. Mm. Mom, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. I see most children are like that. Yes. When they're sick, they only want their mother or their father. They only want them. And they feel bad and only with them because they feel the unconditional love. It's healing. Children know that's the healer. They know where the healing comes from. They know it automatically. We lose it when we grow up. That's all. So that's all we're going to do today. Mm. Please, would you 